On March 1st, 2024, Akira Toriyama was laid to rest. This was made public on March 7th, and since then, the world mourned. Multiple different leaders of different countries spoke up about Toriyama. Every major mangaka still alive, and virtually every animator who we all know by name had comments to make about Akira Toriyama. Content creators, artists, streamers, and everybody in between, including literally billions of fans, mourn the loss of somebody who shaped our life and is the reason, is the main reason as to why many of us are where we are at, including myself. Akira Toriyama's work has impacted billions and myself since I was four years old. And he will no doubt be remembered forever. Today, however, I want to celebrate the life of Akira Toriyama. I want to tell you about the man Akira Toriyama. How he became the man he became. How he was discovered. Where he's from. I want, by the end of this video, that you know more about Akira Toriyama than you knew prior to this video. And even though every video on my channel is in one way or another a form of tribute to him, none will be more difficult to make than this one. But also, I am proud to put this together for you because I think it needs to be done. And I really hope that you enjoy it and I hope that it inspires you to achieve your greatness in your life. Today we present as part of the Toriyama-centric documentary series Dragon Ball In-Depth we present the life of Akira Toriyama. Akira Toriyama was born April 5th, 1955 to Karazu and Tombi Toriyama in Nagoya, Aichi, Japan. He was the first of two children. His Younger sister, Uzura Toriyama, was born two years later. Toriyama's name literally means Bright Bird Mountain, which I always found interesting because he founded a studio called Bird Studios and even had an avatar before he adopted Toribot of him as a bird. Birds would be a recurring thing Toriyama would reference and acknowledge in his life. Toriyama would grow up in Kiyosu, Japan, and this is where his early life would shape his future. And like many other kids from many decades, his life would be changed and altered forever by the works of Walt Disney Pictures. A young Toriyama watched 101 Dalmatians, the Disney animated classic, and this was the film that he said inspired him to become an artist. Besides that, Toriyama had great respect for the man who was considered the father of Japanese manga, Osamu Tezuka, and 1952's Astro Boy. This would set Toriyama on a path in his life that would make him world-renowned. He just didn't know it yet. Now, besides being into art and manga, Toriyama himself stated that he was into other things during the summer vacation months, such as Tokusatsu, which is live-action Japanese television, Kamen Rider, and Ultraman, and Super Sentai, and of course, Gojira known to us as Godzilla, which pretty much every single Japanese person grew up familiar with. Of course, like many other kids, Toriyama's parents wanted him to become a doctor or some kind of serious businessman, something that would provide a nice wage and be respectable and give him his very basic living. But Toriyama was more of a creative. Remember what I said about his name? If Toriyama was a bird, his wings would be way too bright to be caged. As fate would have it, one day in the 70s, Akira Toriyama goes into a coffee shop to read some manga and discovers an article in a magazine called Juvenile Magazine Weekly, where they're looking for new manga writers and new manga artists, and there's a contest, and the winner would get $500,000 yen and be published in the magazine. Toriyama started drawing, but when he returned to the coffee shop, the deadline had already passed. At this point, Toriyama could have just rolled over and given up and kept trying to make his parents happy by being that businessman or that doctor, but as luck would have it again, 
there was another opportunity. Dragon Ball has been about perseverance. Goku persevering. Losing, coming back to win, training his body, going through tough times to overcome. Toriyama, while not a fighter and not a martial artist and certainly not a hero in the sense of how Goku was to the earth, a literal hero, he still had those same principles of not giving up. And as luck would have it, guess what? Weekly Shonen Jump, the other huge publication from Shueisha Publishing that published manga every week, did a very similar contest. Shueisha was and still is the biggest manga publisher in Japan. Imagine if you took Marvel and DC, just the comic book side, and combined them into one. That's sort of what Shueisha is, albeit to a smaller population of Japanese people. But nevertheless, they are the sole top dog when it comes to Japanese manga. So this was an opportunity even greater than the previous. The contest was called the Monthly Young Jump Award. Once again, trying to find new talent for Weekly Shonen Jump. Toriyama, on his 23rd birthday, said to himself, I'm going to do this. He wanted to win the prize. He wanted to draw a real manga, and that's exactly what he did. So yes, the cash prize is why Toriyama even entered this. I mean, you gotta eat, right? Anyways, in 1977, he submits his entry into Weekly Shonen Jump, a short manga called Awawa World, a period piece about two samurai from feudal Japan who meet a superhero. Unfortunately, he won nothing. Toriyama himself said that he went into this contest very confident, but wound up feeling bummed out when he didn't win. 1977 would be historic for pop culture, but not because of Japan. Because in 1977, the world was introduced to something that, like Dragon Ball, everyone's either seen, grew up with, or at least knows about. Star Wars, along with many other movies from the West, such as Alien, other Disney films, James Cameron movies, Terminator, would all be influentially important in Toriyama's life. But Star Wars was special, and so in 1978, Toriyama would follow up with his next piece, Mysterious Rain Jack, which was a complete parody of Star Wars, featuring stormtroopers, droids. Clearly, Star Wars had an impact. But alas, once again, he wins no awards. With this many failures, you would think that most folks would have given up. Akira Toriyama is not quite like most people. At this point, Toriyama's just straight up, just beside himself. It was almost five years since graduating high school, and the dude literally works at a company where he's drawing socks for a living and still can't get a break in the manga industry. At this point, Toriyama actually started to believe that he may just have to go to school and finish up some kind of degree. But then he gets a call from a man whom would be his mentor, close friend, advocate, and someone who would stick by him throughout his entire life, a man by the name of Kazuhiko Torishima. Kazuhiko Torishima was an editor for Weekly Shonen Jump magazine, and he called Toriyama enthusiastically, asking him to please send him more pages directly to him so he can publish them in the magazine. Toriyama had found a fan in a very high up executive in Shueisha and a very respected man. Torishima revealed in an interview that Toriyama's Star Wars parody was good, but it could not win any prizes because parodies aren't allowed to win per the contest rules. It has to be original work. But it didn't mean they didn't recognize Toriyama's talent. And at that time, Toroshima was an editor. And along with the other editors, part of their job was to scout talent. And it just so happened that the month that Toriyama submitted his manga was the month that it was Toroshima's turn to find a new golden boy. Talk about a nice showing of how funny life is. At this point, Toriyama was living with his parents and had no money and was sending art periodically to Torishima at Shueisha to try and get something done. But it wasn't until the end of 1978 that his big break happened because in the November issue of Weekly Shonen Jump, 
Toriyama's first published manga would appear called Wonder Island. This was a one-shot manga that takes place during World War II about a kamikaze pilot who lands on a mysterious island. Unfortunately, it was not a success with readers, but at least he's published. But Toriyama believed in the concept, so he would follow it up with a sequel, another chapter to Wonder Island, in January of 1979. But this is where Toriyama's comedy really began to shine with readers, and it would continue on to his third published piece in April of 1979 called Today's Highlight Island. This one's about a boy with a toothache who ends up going to see a goat doctor, and this doctor claims to be able to fix any health issue, but instead it ends up being this crazy calamity of an experiment and does not fix the problem. People started to like this, and it would actually begin the style of comedy that Toriyama would put into Dr. Slump and Dragon Ball, but we'll talk about that in just a moment. While Toriyama is submitting his next piece of work, Tomato Girl Detective, Torishima still believes in him, even if he's not who he would become just yet. But Torishima still believing in him and being his mentor, this is why Toriyama respects him so much and why they stand in communication and why Torishima was one of the first people that he even consulted during his work on Resurrection F all the way in 2015. Torishima was loyal to Toriyama and Toriyama in turn did the same. Later in 1979, Torishima felt that Toriyama was finally ready to get his own weekly serialized manga, and that would be the adventurous science fiction comedy known as Dr. Slump, featuring the story of Senbei Noromaki and his artificial creation, Arale. Now, originally, Arale was supposed to be just a one-shot character, and the manga was supposed to be about a bunch of different inventions that Senbei would come up with and every month would have like a new invention and a new adventure. Now, aspects of that were still put into Dr. Slump, but it was Torishima that recommended that Arale become the secondary lead or actually the lead itself. Now, you have to understand that back in the late 70s and the early 80s, having a female, a girl robot be the lead of a shonen manga, which is made for boys, was not a common thing especially a childlike girl robot. But Torishima believed in Arale and most of all believed in Toriyama to make it work, and he did. Ironically enough and comedically enough, Toriyama chose to have one of the, well, the main villain of Dr. Slump, which would be introduced later on in the manga, be a parody of Torishima himself, Dr. Mashirito, which is a play on the word Torishima. And at the time, of course, Torishima had this big afro, so Mashirito would have one too. And Toriyama would always joke about how, even though he respected Torishima and they were very close, Torishima was very demanding and very much rejected a lot of Toriyama's ideas and works, which is actually something that would continue into Dragon Ball as well. And Toriyama would make fun of him because... He was annoyed as to how many rejections he got, but it was all in good fun, and of course, Torishima still respected him and knew that he was in on the joke and appreciated it. In Daizenshu 4, Toriyama has an extensive interview where he talks about how grateful he is for his friendship with Torishima, and that had it not been for Torishima, there would be no Toriyama. As the series progressed, Dr. Slump got more and more popular. I know a lot of people... Well, almost everybody came to this channel for Dragon Ball, and you're more familiar with Dragon Ball, but you have to understand that before Dragon Ball, Dr. Slump was Toriyama's big hit. Toriyama didn't even need to make Dragon Ball to make ends meet because Dr. Slump was such a massive success, and Arale and Senbei were such cultural icons to Japan. Even to this day, their faces are on the Japanese subway train pamphlets, and I know because I own one. Toriyama was already a millionaire, a multi-millionaire, before he even drew a single frame of Goku. If you've never read Dr. Slump and you like Toriyama's comedy, I suggest you do read it. Because not only was it a commercial success, it was a critical success as well. Because in 1981, Toriyama won this very prestigious award for Dr. Slump as the best shonen slash shoujo manga of the year. 
Dr. Slump was so popular that Toei Animation came along, and at the time, Toei was the biggest producer of Japanese television shows for young people and kids than anybody. They're the Disney of Japan. They were producing live action shows like Kamen Rider, Super Sentai, and other toku shows, as well as some of the world's most renowned anime. And they came to Toriyama and wanted to adapt Dr. Slump into an anime. And so, in 1981, the Dr. Slump anime began on Fuji Television, animated by Toei Animation and produced by them, with Toriyama making multiple appearances in the anime himself. Now, obviously, Toriyama did not voice himself. In fact, it was Toshio Furukawa, the voice of Piccolo, who would voice him he was doing an impression of the man, and his sense of humor was still very much intact in those episodes. When Dr. Slump's anime dropped, this thing became a phenomenon. There were video games produced, there were all kinds of merchandise from backpacks to pencil holders, everything you can think of, toys, action figures, and Toriyama's bank account rose and rose, as did his success and the respect of his peers and fans in the Japanese manga industry. And this is all before Dragon Ball. Morning Sun Magazine in 1981 named Toriyama the 35th wealthiest person in Japan and could have probably retired right then and there, but his work ethic and his creative juices kept flowing and he kept writing and Dr. Slump stayed in publication for about four years. Remember that scene in Scarface where Tony Montana is talking to Elvira and he tells her, all I need is a woman and I can go right to the top. Well, Toriyama was already at the top, but now he needed a woman and he certainly found one. There was another manga author in Shueisha working at the time named Makami Nachi. She would be most famous for a manga called The Top and Bottom of Rock and Roll and The Confusing Legend of Saint Mephisto. Neither one of those were as big as Dr. Slump but they were still respected works. Toriyama would discuss this in detail in the title page of Dr. Slump chapter 64, where he discussed actually going out to a group dinner with about four or five other mangaka, and that was sort of his way in, so to speak. But, you know, Toriyama, like a lot of people, including some of you guys, is very introverted and shy. He's not just the guy who can just come out and be bombastic and be this sort of over-the-top superstar like what Mr. Satan would become in the Dragon Ball manga. He's more of a quiet guy. Maybe like Ten Shinhan? As luck would have it, not only was she from Nagoya, but she also liked the countryside too. So that's very good when it comes to finding a wife. You want to find someone who at least likes to live in the same area as you, right? So that's a good first step for Toriyama and his bride-to-be. Toriyama said the following about her in an interview. I admired her for her adult personality and her attention to other people's needs. I like efficient people. I'm pretty impatient, so I can't stand people who putter around. Efficient, sexy women are great. <laughs> I love this guy. He also says that he likes women with short hair and glasses, and wouldn't you know it, she's got short hair and glasses. But Toriyama was not very experienced with dating at the time. But as fate would have it, she liked his quirkiness, and the two were married on May 2nd, 1982. But because Toriyama was famous as hell at the time, guess what happened? The paparazzi crashed his wedding. The wedding was a small ceremony, not anything bombastic like the celebrities we see nowadays getting married. It was a small private ceremony and a bunch of paparazzi came in with cameras and this is what led to Toriyama's introversion. If you've wondered why there's so little footage of Toriyama and so little public interviews with him, it's because he does not like being on camera, he's very camera shy, he does not like attention, he almost has anxiety over it. It gives him a legitimate anxiety attack and a lot of people think it's because of this event. The guy's trying to get married to a woman whom would bear his children in a few years, and the media wouldn't leave him alone even on that day. After Dr. Slump ended, what was next for Toriyama? A vacation, a break with his wife, but then his next big hit was right around the corner. 
after producing a few one shots and kind of testing the waters with kung fu themed stories, Dragon Ball began in Weekly Shonen Jump. Remember how I said earlier about how much Toriyama admired the father of manga Osamu Tezuka, the creator of Astro Boy? Well, the feeling was mutual. Before his death in 1989, Tezuka referred to Toriyama as being almost too good and his heir apparent. So now you have, without question, the father of manga, the man who predates everybody, saying that Akira Toriyama is the heir apparent to the throne of manga. That's about as big a praise as you can get. Now, when it comes to Dragon Ball, there's a number of other videos that I think you should watch. Part of the Dragon Ball in-depth series that work as companion pieces to this video. First and foremost, I've done Dragon Ball in-depths on both Dragon Boy and Tongpu, which were Toriyama's precursors to Dragon Ball. Two mangas that he drew in between Dr. Slump and Dragon Ball that kind of had a lot of the elements of Dragon Ball in them prior to him really finalizing his idea with Dragon Ball. Following that, I have a video called The Creation of Dragon Ball that goes into the early months and the early concepts that Toriyama had behind Dragon Ball, including early concept art for the characters of Goku, Bulma, and Oolong, and it sort of tells a bullet point by bullet point story of how we got from Toriyama's initial conception of Dragon Ball to the Dragon Ball we wound up seeing now. So I do highly recommend you watch those videos to have a complete understanding of Toriyama's mindset during the time that he was creating and crafting early Dragon Ball. Now, one of the things a lot of folks don't know is that Toriyama wanted to end the Dr. Slump series. Even though it was popular, he wanted to end it about six months after making it, but Shueisha said, we're only going to let you do that if you have another serial shortly after. So, what ended up happening was Toriyama for a while just kept doing slump and doing some one shots here and there but it wasn't until 1984 that Toriyama would actually continue with the next big project which would be of course Dragon Ball now one of the things I mentioned in the previous section was that Toriyama was a big fan of films I talked about Star Wars and sci-fi and things like that western and eastern films animated and live action but also he loved kung fu films growing up an avid fan of both bruce lee and jackie chan and tons of wuxia movies that were a staple in asian culture as well as of course reading journey to the west aka sayuki and so many of Sayuki's elements would bleed into Dragon Ball. There's a whole playlist on my channel called Dragon Ball and Sayuki, where we talk about all the different aspects of the series that Toriyama would borrow or be inspired by to craft this work. This love of Kung Fu films is what would lead to Dragon Ball, with Torishima once again suggesting that Toriyama draw a Kung Fu themed story. Dragon Ball would begin publication in 1984 and became one of the most successful manga and one of the highest selling manga of all time in Japan during its 11 year run and of course would blow up internationally as well thanks to the distribution of the Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z anime in numerous countries around the world. Dragon Ball has since become a cultural phenomenon and the anime was a big part of it, but it all starts with the manga. It all starts with Toriyama's original story. And the anime took liberties and changed things. And there were, you know, obviously there was also Dragon Ball GT, which had no manga. But even before all of that, the original manga is the true story. In other words, even though Toriyama has been involved in other projects, such as recent movies and even Dragon Ball Daima and things of that nature, supervising Dragon Ball Super's manga and things like that. The original 42 volumes of the manga are from his pen and from ideas pitched to him by his editors and his wife, and that's it. People have had canon debates in this fandom for years about what is and isn't canon, and 99% of them get it wrong. If there is ever a one true canon that was 100% written by Toriyama with no other writers, no other people monitoring his work, changing his work, adding things to his work that weren't originally there without his pen, 
It's the original 42 volumes of the Dragon Ball manga. End of story. I guess you could maybe count Jocko because that was all him. But besides the Jocko, which is kind of more of a spinoff, and Neko Majin, the original Dragon Ball manga is the canon of Dragon Ball. Undisputably. Toriyama never wrote a single episode of Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball GT, or even Dragon Ball Super. Those were other writers taking his work and adapting it for television or manga format, not just Toriyama writing everything. Toriyama's manuscripts for the original arcs of Dragon Ball Super are still only in the possession of the creative team at Toei and, of course, Toyotaro and that team at Shueisha. Even the movies like Resurrection F, Dragon Ball Super Broly, and Dragon Ball Super Superhero were 100% Toriyama scripts, but the visuals were done by somebody else. So you could even debate those as being quote-unquote canon or not. But what's undebatable is that the original volumes of the manga, that's Dragon Ball from the eyes and the mind of Toriyama and his editors. And there are numerous things that Toriyama did do for the anime. For example, concept art and designs for various filler characters like Paikuhan and the Dragon Ball GT characters. Some of the filler aspects of the series. Some of the planets that were visited that weren't in the anime. And even the movie characters Toriyama had a hand in creating with the series producer Takao Koyama back in the day. So manga was not the only thing Toriyama was doing at the time. At the time, Toriyama's fame through Dragon Ball and Slump had gotten so big and his art had become so distinguishable that he started working on other projects in the realm of video games, namely working alongside Yuji Hori for the Dragon Quest series, designing all the characters and the monsters. Dragon Quest monsters are not only absolutely iconic in Japan, but other RPG series like Final Fantasy and Pokemon have borrowed numerous concepts and styles from Toriyama's art in Dragon Quest. So he was working on Dragon Quest and other video games such as Chrono Trigger and even did some art for some smaller projects and even some of the Dragon Ball video games while he was working on the Dragon Ball manga and even helping out the anime staff with the movies and with the TV show. Now, as Dragon Ball progressed, everybody knows that it started as a kung fu comedy manga and then slowly sort of developed into more of an action-themed, darker story. Right around the time of the Red Ribbon Army arc into the 22nd Budokai, and especially during the Demon King Piccolo arc of Dragon Ball, and because of the obvious tonal shift that happened where Toriyama began to tell longer and more epic stories, Dragon Ball's anime decided to rebrand itself from Dragon Ball to Dragon Ball Z. And because of this rebranding, many feel it's led to the popularity of Dragon Ball exploding even further because Dragon Ball Z kind of felt more like a superhero comic book adventure fight story that resonated with teenagers and young adults in Western audiences a bit closer than the original Dragon Ball may have when it came out. Now, this is obviously up for debate. And I still feel like even if you got into the series with DBZ, you need to go back and watch Dragon Ball to get the entire story, to get all of Goku's development, to understand everything, every aspect of these characters and how they came together. It's like watching Empire Strikes Back without seeing the original Star Wars. You're only getting a piece of the puzzle. And Dragon Ball must be respected along with Z as Toriyama's entire vision. That's his vision, that's his story, and it should not be ignored. Especially since there are so many great fights and battles in Dragon Ball that Z fans would love if they just gave it a chance. But nevertheless, in 1995, Dragon Ball came to an end, and Toriyama himself was likely very exhausted, very tired after working on Dragon Ball for 11 years and being a full-time manga artist since around 1978, 1979. So literally this man put 16 years of his life into producing a weekly chapter of a manga and took one vacation. However, during the time of Dragon Ball, it wasn't all just hard work. Toriyama had children 
1987, Toriyama's first son, Sasuke, was born. He joked about this in one of the cover pages where he talked about him having a kid would give him an excuse to go to the toy store. Let's not forget that Toriyama loved toys. He loved model cars. He loved playing with them and constructing them. He loved drawing them. He was just a big kid at heart, which is probably why his stories resonated with so many of us when we were younger. He connected, even though he was a Japanese man, and many of us came from different cultures, different belief systems, different, you know, countries. We're still all kids at heart. And he even said he's helping to change diapers as he draws. He would be blessed with a daughter, Kika Toriyama as well, and both Sasuke and Kika would make little cameos, little Easter eggs in Toriyama's seminal work doing the art for Chrono Trigger, one of the most respected and beloved video games of all time. Later on, he would also help out with Blue Dragon, and his work with Dragon Quest continued even after his retirement. When Toriyama retired in 1995, his work was done as far as being a weekly manga writer, but not his work on being an artist, as he would go on to do these games, as well as help out with some of the early concepts for the Toei Animation exclusive series Dragon Ball GT. Now I've obviously done a video on this back in 2017, the true story of Dragon Ball GT, which must be seen for you to understand that Toriyama's involvement in early GT is actually much more than people really understand. And besides that, Toriyama would draw one-shot mangas here and there and would help produce alternate covers and was kind of a a recluse. When Toriyama retired, he never wanted to become a busybody again. He had already made plenty of money. His stuff was being, you know, franchised all over the country, all over the world in multiple languages. Dragon Ball Z was becoming a phenomenon outside of Japan, in Latin America, in the United States, Canada, the UK, several countries in the Middle East. I mean, everybody on earth knows about Dragon Ball, but Toriyama just kept to himself quietly drawing for Yuji Hori's Dragon Quest and whatever he would do via email. Toriyama rarely, if ever, visited the animation studio or rarely, if ever, worked on anything outside of his own home in these days. That's the good thing about Toriyama's life is that even though he's no longer with us, he was happy during his final days because he was at home with his family, his kids grew up, he got to spend time with them, watching them grow up, he had plenty of money, so he wouldn't have to worry about ever going broke ever again. And he was able to work literally through email. We found out in a documentary celebrating the anniversary of Dragon Quest that even to this day, Toriyama declines in-person interviews. It's all going to be done via email and possibly a phone conversation from certain people close to him, such as Akio Ioku and maybe Toyotaro. Toriyama worked his rear end off for the first half of his life to make his fortune. And the good thing is that the last half of his life, he got to enjoy that as well as continue working on a part-time basis. Even when the Dragon Ball Renaissance came along, starting with Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods, a project that Toriyama was originally not involved in, but was compelled to be involved with it because he wasn't sure if he trusted Toei Animation to produce a film after the abomination that was Dragon Ball Evolution. Now, Dragon Ball Evolution was not a Toei animated film, obviously, but Dragon Ball Evolution was done without even a simple phone call. Not a single person working on Evolution called Toriyama to get his consultation. Instead, they produced the film, which at first Toriyama was trying to give it a chance and was open-minded about, but when he saw it, he was disgusted with it and kind of became a bit more controlling of his legacy, and thus he helped out with Battle of Gods, revising a script written by Yusuke Watanabe. After that, with the follow-up, Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F, Toriyama penned the script and wrote his first full script for a film, ever. You have to understand, like I mentioned earlier, he's never written a single episode of Dragon Ball Z, GT, or anything. He just wrote the manga and then gave notes and things like that. The anime staff took over. With Resurrection F, every word was written by Toriyama. And obviously he had Torishima and others to consult with. It was still Toriyama. 
Now, right around the success of Resurrection F came Dragon Ball Super. And Dragon Ball Super, of course, is really what brought all of us back into Dragon Ball in 2015. And Toriyama would write very basic manuscripts and do some concept art for the series, but most of it was handled by Toei Animation, who would oftentimes adapt his stories but add things that make changes. For example, the idea of having Vegito Blue in the Goku Black arc was an idea that Toei came up with and later Toyotaro adapted. Some of the characters in the Terminator Power, like for example, Kale, was an idea from the staff, uh, specifically Akio Ioku, who wanted to capitalize on the success of Broly overseas. Now you have to understand that at this time, Toriyama was involved, but Dragon Ball did become a corporate entity. And as a result of it being corporate, you had a lot of different people giving their opinions. Victory Uchida, Toyotaro, Akio Ioku, there were numerous people working along with Toriyama on this, and sometimes things would actually make the finished product that worked by his hand. This is why it's difficult to discuss canon when it comes to the modern stuff because Toriyama was only a percentage of the creative team behind it. Now with Dragon Ball Daima in 2024, Toriyama is, while not 100% writing everything, Toriyama was there to supervise the scripts for the series. He wrote the base story. He designed a lot of the characters, if not all of them, and a bunch of the vehicles and the worlds. So it's as close to his vision as anything we've gotten since Jocko. It's as close to his vision as anything we've gotten, with the exception of those Dragon Ball movies, Resurrection F, Broly, and Superhero, because he was way more involved in this than anything else. And it's almost bittersweet because while I'm happy that Toriyama was able to come back and become a much more prominent figure in the production of the 2024 Dragon Ball anime, it's also very sad because the poor guy would not live to see the premiere of the anime in fall of 2024. When Akira Toriyama passed away, I was very numb for several hours. I didn't know what to think. I had millions of thoughts running through my head like, how do I talk about this? Can I talk about this? How do I show respect? What can I do for the fandom? What can I do for you know, myself and my friends? What am I gonna do about this man whose work touched my life? You have to understand, I might be known as the Dragon Ball YouTube guy, but I discovered Dragon Quest when I was four years old because my older brother introduced me to it. Literally when I was four, I have literally grown up with Toriyama art. From a little four-year-old kid to a man who's about to hit the age of 40 this year. I'm as old as Dragon Ball itself. And I owe my entire life to Akira Toriyama. Toriyama brought me closer to my friends, introduced me to new friends. Toriyama created many wonderful moments with me and people I've been with in friendships and relationships. Toriyama has bonded me with many people, including many of you. Toriyama has been literally probably the most famous, important person that directly impacted my life. Had it not been for him, I wouldn't be able to pay medical bills that I have or help out my friends in times of need. I wouldn't have this home that I'm in right now. It was Toriyama's work that inspired me to work and his work ethic that made me work to honor him. And I've always been the guy who's been telling you, okay, Toriyama said this, Toriyama said that, he didn't say this, he didn't say that. And some of the stuff he wrote was brilliant, not everything he wrote was perfect, but he is somebody who has shaped my existence. And for that, I will never forget him. We will never forget him. And with this video, I pay tribute to the life of Akira Toriyama. My thoughts and prayers go out to his family, his wife, his two children who are now grown, and to every Dragon Ball fan. It, even though Dragon Ball will likely continue on without him, whether it be the manga from Toyotaro or other anime series and movies, and even though the future of Dragon Quest is also in question, it's going to feel a little weird without him. Or at least without knowing that he was always there to answer questions from the creative team and to help build this world. 
Dragon Ball Daima will be a very emotional viewing for me and many of you. So with this video, I pay tribute to Akira Toriyama. Thank you for watching and thank you Toriyama Sensei for literally changing my life.